So I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, so thank you everyone for joining in with us today. Um, welcome to uh, this week's SEDS Online webinar. As always, we'd like to thank our sponsorship from IAS, which allows us to offer all of these resources free of charge. This includes the recorded lectures, any learning tools, and even some virtual field trips that are, um, that are, that are hosted. So take a look on the website and you can see all of our new info um, based off all of these different kinds of tools. Today's lecture is by Dr. Tracy Frank, who is currently a, a professor and head of the Department of Geosciences at the University of Connecticut. Tracy received her master's and PhD in geology at the University of Michigan. And Dr. Frank is a sedimentologist and geochemist and was a professor and chair of the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Her research spans paleoceanography, climatology, sedimentology, and geochemistry with a special interest in mass extinctions. And today she will be discussing the salty tales of diagenesis in Antarctica. As a reminder, the chat is closed until nearing the end of the presentation, which then we welcome all questions and comments from the presentation. And so uh, with that, I welcome Dr. Frank and I'll pass on the mic to you. All right, thanks Kimberly. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking SEDS Online for inviting me to give this seminar, and I'd like to thank everyone out there for taking the time to listen to this seminar today. Thanks for coming. Diagenesis is governed by the interplay between a number of controlling factors that link back to tectonic setting, depositional environment, and climate. Antarctica represents an extreme in some of these factors. And in this talk, I'll show how these extremes impact diagenetic processes and products. The work I'm gonna talk about stems from discoveries made during the Andril project. The Andril project was an international drilling program that involved researchers from the US, New Zealand, Italy, and Germany, and it was focused on getting stratigraphic records of Cenozoic climate change from Antarctic shells. And my role in that project was as the inorganic geochemist. So I was squeezing pore water from sediments as they were recovered in the drill core. And that is what led to uh, the things I'm gonna talk about today. This research has been supported by the US National Science Foundation, and it's involved uh, quite a large number of people, not only participants from the Andrew Project, but uh, the group at, at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, myself, Chris Fielding, and some of our students, as well as uh, Peter Swartz lab group at Rasmus at the University of Miami, uh, who did Compt Isotope work on this project. So this talk is basically a synthesis of all of this work. The area of focus is the McMurdo Sound region in the southwestern Ross Sea embayment, shown here in this red square. This area uh, was a launching point for some of the major expeditions during the heroic age, uh, expeditions of Shackleton, Scott, and others. Today, the US and New Zealand have research stations here on Ross Island. One of the more unusual landscapes in the region are the McMurdo Dry Valleys, which are shown in the red square I've just popped up here. They're a row of largely snow-free valleys within the Transantarctic mountain chain, which lies west of McMurdo Sound. And they represent the largest snow-free area in Antarctica. Here's an image from the air of the dry valleys. Stratigraphic data indicate that the valleys have had more or less their present topography since at least the Oligocene. So they are long-standing features of the area. Uh, at times, they served as outlets for the Eastern Antarctic ice sheet to drain through the valleys and into McMurdo Sound. And at other times, when it got even colder, the Western Antarctic ice sheet expanded up into the valleys and, dropped, and, and blocked their seaward terminations. 
There are marine deposits within these valleys, which show that they were flooded during warmer periods to form fjords. Here's some images on the ground from Wright Valley to give you a sense of how dry and barren these areas actually are. The valleys are extremely cold, arid, and windy. The average annual temperature for the valleys is around minus 20. Precipitation averages about 10 centimeters water equivalent in the form of snow, but that snow evaporates because of the catabatic winds that flow down the valleys. And these winds are amazing. They can reach speeds exceeding 300 miles per hour. Despite the aridity, the valleys contain a number of permanently ice covered closed basin lakes which range in their chemistry from freshwater to highly saline. Uh, one example is shown in this image here. This is Lake Vanda. Uh, these lakes are late quaternary features, and it appears that they've been much larger at times in the past. Um, here's a group making their way through the right valley on the ground, and I included this image here. Uh, there are mummified seals in the valley. It gives you an idea of how cold and dry the area actually is. Uh, these seals can be thousands of years old in some cases. Um, there are a lot of uh, studies being done trying to understand what led them to uh, come up the dry valleys and ultimately die there. Offshore from the valleys is the McMurdo Sound region. This area has been of scientific interest because it's been influenced by three significant components of the Antarctic cryosphere. And these include sea ice in the Ross Sea embayment here. They include the Ross Ice Shelf, which you can see here, which is an extension of the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, and the East Antarctic Ice Sheet, which at times has flowed through the dry valleys and into McMurdo Sound. There have been a number of drilling programs since the 1970s that have drilled cores into the shelf here in order to understand the Cenozoic climate history of Antarctica. The most recent of these was the Andril project, and you can see the locations of the two cores drilled by this project here. Um, I'll spend uh, quite a lot of time talking about Andril 2A because it plays a major role in this story. So here's a cross section showing the Transantarctic Mountains onto the west and extending out offshore into the Victoria Land Basin. These cores have been drilled in the Victoria Land Basin, and you can see the locations of some of them along the cross section here. The basin is basically a half graben system that's been active since the Eocene and affected by neogene volcanism. The basin fill is mainly glacial marine sediments. I want to digress a moment to give you an idea of how the cores are recovered in this area. The basic setup is a drilling rig, like the one you can see in this cartoon here, which is set up on multi-year sea ice. So the drilling is done during the colder part of the season when it's possible to work down in Antarctica. And uh, a drill pipe is then extended through the sea ice, down through the water column, and into the sediment. Here's the actual rig used by the Andril program. It's got a tent on it to keep the drillers nice and warm. But here's a cross section showing you what this rig looks like. It's a uh, continuous wireline coring system. Again, it's set up on sea ice or an ice shelf platform. It can drill in 1,000 meters of water and up to 1,500 meters below the seafloor. And it's a diamond uh, coring, coring system, so the recovery is great. It's up to 97% recovery. This slide here shows a graphic log on the left of the Andril 2A core, which reached down to about 1,034 meters below the seafloor.
along with a few examples of the lithophases that were recovered in this core. And similar lithophases have been recovered in all of the drill cores uh, drilled in this area. The succession is dominated by diamicton, which is not too surprising. And that's represented here in green. Um, these record ice contact proglacial conditions. And other facies record settings ranging from glacial marine, like you can see here, and open marine shelf. And the range of lithophases that we see in these cores indicate that climate conditions have been quite variable through the Cenozoic. Within the stratigraphy, six recurring stratigraphic motifs have been recognized and described by Chris Fielding in a couple of publications here. They're interpreted to reflect variations in climate regime. So at one end of the spectrum is the cold, dry-based glacial regime of today. And these successions are dominated by diamictons. And at the other end of the spectrum, is rep we see uh, facy sequences that record ice-free coastlines. These motifs have been used to reconstruct the Cenozoic climate record of the region. And the example I'm showing you here is from the Andral 2A core. These stratigraphic data tell us that during cold periods, the valleys and continental margins were glaciated. So it would have looked something like this. But during times of peak warmth, the valleys were flooded by the sea. There were ice-free coastlines and tundra vegetation extended as much as 80 kilometers inland. And of course, there were at times when conditions lay between these two end members. So with that background, I wanna move on to the meat of the talk today and get to diagenetic processes and products in this setting. So beyond the paleoclimate information, that's been the real focus of study on these cores. They do contain a lot of interesting diagenetic features. One feature is that they tend to be heavily cemented by carbonate cements. And this is somewhat unexpected given the setting. Um, one, one might expect that these sediments have a very low diagenetic potential. But cement fills intergranular pore space as well as late stage fractures, and it becomes increasingly prominent with depth. The mineralogy of these cements is very interesting. A lot of it is calcite, but there are also dolomite cements and even aragonite. The morphology of the cement shows a pattern uh, with depth, ranging from fibrous to bladed cements at shallower depth shown here. These are examples of aragonite cement in these cores. To microgranular cement to blocky mosaics, again, completely filling intragranular primary pore space, to poikilotopic cement, especially at greater depths. And what's really interesting is that some of this coarse cement is calcite, but in some cases it's aragonite. So that was quite a surprise to us. This cement has been noticed uh, since drilling first began and researchers have been puzzling over its origin. Uh, shown here are some carbon and oxygen isotope data from cements in some cores recovered by the Cape Roberts project, which lies to the north of where the Andrel project was drilling. Also data here from the Andrel project. They have meteoric-like carbon and oxygen isotope signatures. And so the most obvious interpretations involved contributions from meltwater in their precipitation. But these are glacial marine sediments. So this interpretation implied that meltwater flushed out or mixed with conate seawater that would have been buried along with the sediments. This also seems like a setting characterized by low diagenetic potential. So there are questions about the drive for cement precipitation from cold, low ionic strength fluids. This is a rift basin setting. So perhaps 
a high geothermal gradient played a role as the water warmed up in the subsurface, it caused cement to precipitate. The large volume of cement also implies that a large, numbers of a large number of volumes of pore water moved through the sediments. So how do we generate those large water rock ratios in this setting? Another interesting diagenetic feature in these cores relates to the preservation of fossil materials. During these drilling programs, they were really anxious, of course, to date the cores. And so aragonitic fossils were sought after for geochronology using strontium isotopes. There are aragonitic fossils in these cores that appear pristine using petrographic criteria, but these seemingly unaltered shells have much lower than expected delta 18O values, given that they were living at very cold temperatures on the seafloor. And they invariably produce inaccurate strontium isotope ages, given their stratigraphic positions. We saw similar patterns in diatoms. So here are a couple of examples of very well-preserved diatoms um, and some oxygen isotopic data from those diatoms. If those uh, data were used to calculate water temperatures, you can see they resulted in some very unrealistic values for <laughs> this particular setting. Assuming reasonable temperatures of precipitation, these authors then went and tried to calculate the water composition. Uh, the water compositions that they uh, came up with range between about minus 10 to minus 12 per mil SMO, which again is very unlikely given that these are marine diatoms. It wasn't until the Andrel project that we started to get answers to these questions. This was the first drilling project to include routine pore water sampling as part of the drilling protocol. We were able to collect pore water every 10 meters or so to a depth of almost 1,000 meters below the seafloor. And we adapted the sampling and analytical methods used for a long time by the ocean drilling program. So here's our squeezer setup that we used here. So we would take a whole round section of core, which were cut just as the core is being brought up from the subsurface. Uh, we place them in the squeezing device and then apply pressure to collect the pore waters. Here are pore water profiles from the andral core. So here's the graphic log of the andral core. Uh, the first profile here is salinity. I note that the orange stars in this diagram denote local seawater composition. If we start with salinity, you can see the upper part of the core, the pore fluids are close to seawater salinities. But when we get to a depth of a below, below 200 meters below seafloor, there's a great increase in the salinity. And in fact, the pore waters reach salinities approaching six times that of seawater. The orange squares that you see across the middle here are samples that were taken directly from the borehole. So at one point during drilling, the bit, the bit entered a zone of unconsolidated sand that was pressurized with brine. And this brine flowed in and it migrated 27 meters up the inside of the barrel and uh, caused the drill, drill to get stuck. They were able to fix things up ultimately, but it required that the remainder of the hole be drilled using a much higher density drilling mud because of the density of the pore fluids in this area. So again, we're dealing with a brine below about 200 meters here. Uh, the next column here shows delta 18 O values of the brine, and you can see they're quite low, around minus 10 per mil. And you can see that the concentrations of other major elements increase down core. This is just an image of, of the borehole. When we examined ratios of conservative elements in the pore water, 
we found that uh, seawater ratios were maintained across the full range of salinities, more or less. And so, of course, this suggested that the brine was derived from seawater. Now, the most common way to create a brine in nature is via evaporation. But this mechanism doesn't fit what we know about the history of the Victoria Land Basin. The explanation that best fits observations relates to salts being expelled during sea ice formation, so cryogenic concentration of seawater. As ice consolidates from seawater, salts from the seawater are expelled to form brines. And in the first instance, this brine collects in little channels in the sea ice. And that's what this little diagram here shows. The freezing temperature of the brine falls as it increases in salinity. And this brine ultimately becomes so dense that it begins to collect and it flows through cracks in the sea ice towards the sea floor. Now the brine is super cooled, so it freezes the seawater it comes into contact with to create a tube through which the brine forms. And this can create these interesting features called brinicles. I'm just gonna show you a, a little clip here from a BBC documentary. So you can see um, the brine flowing out in the first instance, and this is this brinicle slowly growing around flowing brine ultimately to touch the seafloor. If you continue watching this film, you can see the brine spilling out over the seafloor and soaking into the subsurface. Evaporation and freezing generate very different pathways in terms of the evolution of brine composition and the mineralogy of the precipitates that form. So here I'm showing the differences uh, among sodium, sulfate, and bromine. During evaporation, we have a steady sodium to chloride ratio maintained until the onset of halite precipitation. But during freezing, one of the first things to form is a mineral called mirabilite, which is a sodium rich mineral. And of course, this lowers the sodium chloride ratio of the brine and causes the trend in brine chemistry to diverge from that of evaporation. And if we take our data from the andral core and we plot it on top of these trends, you can see that they are consistent with this idea that the brine is a product of seawater freezing. How do we account for the low delta 18O values of the brine? Again, they sit at about minus 10 per mil SMO. Well, this diagram from Harita shows the evolution of waters in natural brine forming processes. Um, evaporation tends to increase the delta 18O value of brines because the lighter isotopes are preferentially evaporated. But we see the opposite being true during the freezing of seawater because the heavier isotopes tend to go into the solid component, whether it be ice or a mineral precipitate. Now, because the pore water in the brine and the andral core has been sitting in the subsurface for a while, we can't rule out the possibility of water rock exchange. The processes that lead to the largest fractionations include devitrification and zeolitization of volcanic glass. There has been volcanism in this area, but in the andral core, these components are only abundant in younger strata that lie above the depth at which the brine occurs in Andral 2A. So uh, it seems like there might be a way to explain these low delta 18O values that we see in these cements and um, also their abundance in the subsurface. Perhaps they precipitated from this brine. Well, in order to try to prove that hypothesis, we turn to clumped isotope paleothermometry. And as I'm sure many of you know, this is a temperature proxy based on the measurements of the degree of ordering of carbon-13 and oxygen-18 in carbonate minerals. It's independent of the oxygen isotopic composition of the water from which the carbonate precipitated. 
So when we pair it with conventional carbon oxygen isotope compositions of carbonate phases, we can do a back calculation on the composition of the fluid. In the case of the andral core, it was an ideal case because we have the compositions of the pore water and we can measure the isotopic composition of the cement. So this is where we uh, look at Phil Stoudigal's work on this. He did the clumped isotope work on the andral 2A core. Um, we were looking, we were expecting some low temperatures of precipitation. So he first calibrated the clumped isotope proxy using synthetic carbonates. And this is just a plot of his calibration here. It's very good. And here are the results. The squares in this diagram uh, represent intergranular cement. The red and black circles that you can see here are the compositions of fossil material. Now I don't have time to get into the carbon oxygen or the carbon isotopic data. So I'm gonna focus on the remainder of the diagram. Here you can see the delta 18 O values of these different phases. Uh, the cement phases uh, decrease in delta, their delta 18 O values decrease with depth. You can see the fossil materials, however, have delta 18 O values that are more consistent with formation um, from cold seawater. Here are the temperatures derived from the clumped isotope results, and you can see that they show an increase in temperature with depth in the cement phases, while the fossil materials tend to sit right around freezing temperatures. The fourth plot shows a calculation of the composition of the water from which these cements formed. And the solid line here are the measured data from the andral core. Considering that the pour water and the cements, the pour water has been sitting there for a long time and the cements probably formed some time ago. It's possible that the cement composition has, or the pour water composition has changed a little bit, but there's a pretty good correspondence here. And we think that this uh, shows that yes, the brine is responsible for precipitating all of this cement. We tested this on another core. This is showing the work of Mingyu Yang, along with uh, Megan Smith, who did the clumped isotope work at Rasmus. And we see similar results. The delta 18 O values of the cements are shown here. They show a temperature increase down core and the fluid values calculated for those cements tend to sit around minus 10 per mil. So they're consistent with what we're seeing in the measured compositions of the brine. So if the brine is the cementing agent, the next question is how extensive is this brine? We only have reliable pore water data from one core, but all of these cores that have been drilled in the area show similar cementation patterns and the cements have some unique characteristics. So we can use them as sort of fingerprints for the presence of the brine in these areas. So uh, Ming Yu Yang extended the petrographic study to all of the cores in this region. He found similar uh, cement phases with the low delta 18 O values in all of these cores. And this suggests that this brine is in the subsurface throughout this region in front of the front, in front of the uh, Transantarctic Mountains here. Uh, there are a few DSDP drill sites that fall, fall just off this image here, up, up in this direction here to the Northeast. In, in, in their poor water data, it just shows slightly modified seawater. So it looks like this brine is localized in this area here. Here's a cartoon of the Victoria Land Basin. Again, it's a half graben system that's bounded by these faults. And it could be that the brine had formed in this area and it hasn't been able to migrate further because it's bounded by these faults. If we do a back of the envelope calculation to consider how much of this brine might be in this area, 
we get a number um, of around 27,000 cubic kilometers of brine. That's a lot of brine. And that's a lot of seawater that has to freeze. If you think about how much seawater you have to concentrate to form a small amount of brine. This assumes an average sediment porosity of about 15%. So of course, the next question is, where did all of this brine come from? Well, this is not the first brine to be discovered in the Antarctic region. It's also present in the McMurdo Dry Valleys. The McMurdo Dry Valleys host a series of ice covered closed basin lakes. I showed you a picture of Lake Vanda early in this um, presentation. That's it here from the air. But there are also other lakes in some of the other dry valley regions. The oldest evidence for these lakes is 400,000 years ago. So they are late quaternary features in this area. And that becomes important as we go on. These have been studied by year, for years by the long-term ecological research program. And uh, here I have a salinity profile for Lake Vani. That's this one here, showing you that these lakes are stratified, but they reach salinities of uh, 145 to 150 parts per thousand. So salinity is consistent with what we're seeing in the brine out in McMurdo Sound. If we calculate the, the total brine volume in this area though, compared to what we see in McMurdo Sound, it's, it's very small. Airborne surveys of resistivity have also documented a groundwater system in the Taylor Valley. So in this uh, solid things like ice have high resistivity, liquid water has the blue colors. You can see here. So uh, this, these people, Mikuki and all, um, discovered this uh, groundwater system and these brines are potentially connected in the subsurface and flowing toward McMurdo Sound. Uh, whether they just discharge into the water or flow into the basin itself is unknown. It's an open question at this point. The volume of this brine is on the order of 0.2 to 0.6 cubic kilometers. So it's also pretty small. This diagram uh, is basically a way of comparing the chemistries of the brine in these lakes with what we see in the AND 2A core. The Wright Valley has some very unusual brines. They're calcium chloride brines. They're thought to be the evaporated remnants of lakes mod modified through the influx of calcium rich groundwater with some contributions from seasonal meltwater. Um, that's that's uh, still quite controversial. In the Taylor Valley, the brines have compositions that are very similar in some ways to what we see in the Andral core. Perhaps they're a little bit more evolved. They're thought to have a seawater origin that's been modified through the input of chemical weathering products and sea spray. There are basically two geologic settings in which you can form cryogenic brine in significant amounts. One way is to form it in flexural troughs that form around the outer margins of advancing ice sheets. So you have ice sheets that are advancing and depressing the lithosphere and out beyond the margin, there's a little bit of area that remains depressed but then you get a four bulge developing a little bit further out. And the distance here can be up to about 100 kilometers. So one idea is that this forms a sort of isolated um, seaway and brine can form as seawater freezes, that brine sinks to the sea floor and it migrates into the sediment. And as it migrated into the sediment, it displaced um, the conate seawater, which was less dense and settled into the bottom of the basin. On a smaller scale, where you have times of higher sea level and seawater invades coastal lowlands, you can also isolate seawater. So we see both of these mechanisms um, as having potential in the McMurdo region, 
We did have large ice sheets uh, expanding out into this area, so there could have been flexural troughs forming as these migrated outwards, forming sites of, of seawater forming, of brine formation. On the other hand, during periods of warmth, we know that these seaways were invaded by the sea to form fjords. But then as conditions became cooler and glaciers started expanding again, these areas of the sea could have become cut off and gradually concentrated via freezing to form brines that flowed through the subsurface and into um, the Victoria Land Basin. So we do know today that in the Taylor Valley, groundwater is flowing seaward toward McMurdo Sound. So perhaps this was operating on a greater scale in the past. One clue that helps us with this um, model is that we do find that mineral that precipitates out early on during the freezing process, Mirabilite, present along shorelines in southern McMurdo, McMurdo Sound. I'm showing some sites where uh, Mirabilite is found here with these blue stars. This is what it looks like in outcrop. Um, it's highly soluble, but it's been able to persist here because of the very cold and dry conditions. It tends to occur as discontinuous beds that sometimes show deformation from glacial activity. Um, they contain inclusions of marine fossils and sediment. And we also did some isotopic work on the Mirabilite and found that they have marine-like values. So a marine origin is pretty well confirmed here. So can we say anything about when this brine formed and when the cement precipitated? Well, the, it turns out that the clumped isotope data provides some great insight into that. I wanna go back to the temperature data here. The red line I'm showing you here is the modern geothermal gradient measured during drilling. The clumped isotope data fall along the same slope, but the intercept is offset. This indicates that these phases formed at cooler temperatures than their present position, then the present geothermal gradient would indicate. So what it implies is that the bulk of cements were in place some time ago, probably over a relatively short window of time when the host sediments were at shallower depths. If, they, if these cements were in place at a particular depth in the subsurface or more gradually over a long period of time, it's unlikely that we would have preserved the geothermal gradient. Temperatures at the seafloor in this area are around minus one to minus two degrees C. And the temperatures in the clumped isotope data approach these temperatures at around 200 to 300 meters depth in the core. It's very hard for us to be precise with these sorts of things, but it suggests that this interval of the core was close to the seafloor at the time of brine emplacement. This diagram shows the mid Miocene section of the andral core from which the pore water data and the cement data are from. And it shows how this core correlates to the geomagnetic, polar uh, geomagnetic polarity timescale and other selected data sets. The gray bars in this diagram represent times that are missing from the core. The blue colors represent cold periods and the green colors here represent warmer periods. The lower part of this interval is relatively continuous and it records several episodes of peak warmth that were associated with the Miocene climatic optimum. Proxies from the area indicate that sea surface temperatures in the Ross Sea were six to 10 degrees warmer than they are today. Um, we know that the ice sheet margins retreated inland and the McMurdo Dry Valleys were flooded to form fjords. The overlying section of the core, however, is highly fragmented due to glacial erosion and it 
records cooling and ice sheet expansion associated with the mid-Miocene climate transition. So the clumped isotopes, again, suggest that this interval of the core was at or near the seafloor at the time of brine emplacement. So these relationships overall imply a connection between brine formation and the mid-Miocene climate transition, a time of climate cooling and ice sheet expansion. So the idea here is that this timing supports both of these scenarios. On the one hand, we know the fjords were flooded and there are sills at the end of some of these uh, valleys that could have trapped that, that seawater and it could have frozen in place to form brine. We also know that these ice sheets advanced out into McMurdo Sound. So this model works as well. Uh, Ming Yu Yang was able to extend our data set into the Taylor Valley. And uh, we found results consistent with a younger period of brine formation during the Quaternary. So what we can say so far is that the brine appears to be a significant and long-standing feature of the Victorian Basin, uh, present probably since the mid-Miocene at least. So it's much older than the brine that we see in the McMurdo Dry Valleys. This brine has precipitated a lot of cement and it may alter skeletal material. The data we have so far point to brine formation events during times of cooling. And it should be said that this propensity for brine formation exists in many glacial marine systems and shouldn't be overlooked in studies of modern settings and ancient deposits. I wanna mention that uh, we have some work ongoing. Uh, we're trying to answer the question about whether the brine forms continuously or episodically under certain conditions and at certain times. And we're trying to understand the role of the dry valleys. So our ongoing work involves trying to determine the age of cement phases using, using radioisotope methods. And we're also using changes in cement mineralogy and geochemistry to document flow paths of the brine, um, assuming maybe it migrates away from the dry valleys. And we're also including groundwater met, uh, modeling to test our ideas. The implications of this work extend well beyond understanding diagenetic processes in glacial marine settings. Um, for one thing, the Ross, she Ross Sea Shelf is a major area of oceanic bottom water production. And so we might think about how periods of brine formation have affected oceanic circulation. Um, brine has also been found in the subsurface of other recently glaciated regions of the globe, especially in the Northern Hemisphere. Does it have a similar origin? There's also a lot of interest in liquid water on Mars, brine. Um, and perhaps this information from Antarctica can help us understand the origin, distribution, and significance of liquid water on other planets. One reason this brine is so exciting on Mars is because it could potentially serve as a refuge for life. And so could such brine provide a habitat, habitat for extremophiles? And are there implications for snowball earth and life living through those events. So with that, I'll close and uh, with the obligatory penguin picture and I'll ask for any questions. Thanks for your attention. Gotta go off mute here. Thank you so much, Tracy. That was a fabulous presentation, very interesting. And um, so now we're opening up uh, to the chat room for questions uh, for those participating. If you have any, please feel free to enter your, your questions now into the chat room. Uh, please make sure you're also um, sending them to everyone that's listed um, at the chat room instead of just the SEDS online. So everyone has a chance to see also the questions that are available. Now, I was gonna ask you, actually, I have a, my own question, but you said that's a research topic that's still currently ongoing of um, aging the cements that are currently there within the salt brine. Are there any preliminary results or is this a new fresh topic that you're uh, going into now? We have a few preliminary results. Um, 
we've had a, we've struggled a bit with using uranium lead. Yeah, you know, we were hopeful that with the aragonite cements there might be uranium enough uranium concentrations to use that method. We're still testing that method. Um, we've had some success with the strontium isotope results. Of course, when you use strontium isotopes, you have to worry about uh, inputs from other radiogenic sources. But uh, I guess the idea here is uh, these brines come in, um, they cement, they precipitate cement fairly rapidly. So there's relatively little time for water rock exchange. And so the cements we've dated uh, are consistent with our model in terms of their age. But again, with strontium isotopes, you need to be a little careful. And so we are looking around for other proxies to use to date these things. Okay, very interesting. Thank you. And when you say rapid formation of the cements that are there, are we talking like biogenically fast or still of um, anthro, uh, not biogenically, abiogenically? <laughs> I, you know, the role of microbes and all of this, who knows, but uh, just from a purely abiotic standpoint, I think when you have these highly uh, carbonate supersaturated brines, that's what they are. Um, maybe they're not supersaturated when they're cold, but there's a high geothermal gradient here. So once they enter the subsurface and the temperature increases, that could potentially drive some pretty rapid uh, carbonate precipitation, but I don't, I don't have a handle on exactly how rapid that might be. It does look yeah. like they precipitated in equilibrium, however, so. Wow, As okay, well, I mean, I'm, I look forward then to what the research comes out of this. So I really hope that the, the uranium lead uh, method works. So we have a question. Um, from Stephen Lokirm uh, from Wales. Hi, Tracy, it was a great presentation, thank you. Sorry if I missed this, but what is the chance of conclusively identifying the frigid brine cement in the stratigraphic record? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I've, I've wondered that too, because I've worked on ancient um, glacial, glaci deposits of ancient glaciations myself. Um, one approach might be to uh, look at the fluid inclusions in the cements and see whether or not they are saline and what temperatures they may have precipitated at. That's the best way of getting at it because, you know, you can find uh, cements with similar characteristics uh, precipitating during burial diagenesis, perhaps long after the original deposits formed and you would expect them to have low delta 18 o values so it, it's kind of tough all right well maybe fluid inclusions then could help and be the answer um we have also a question from john reimer from amsterdam uh tracy thanks for the great talk how do you the different cement types meaning aragonite and calcite relate to brines Right. Um, you know, we, we, ex we almost assumed that many of the coarser cements were calcite. And it wasn't until Ming Yu Yang started doing um, optic figures on some of the coarser cements that we discovered that some of them were aragonite. And we've done some preliminary look at the distribution of these cements. And there does seem to be a spatial pattern in them. If we assume that the idea about these brines may be forming in the McMurdo Dry Valleys and then flowing into the subsurface of the Victoria Land Basin is true, we might expect uh, cements to be precipitating out along that flow path. And if that's the case, we might expect aragonite to precipitate out first and uh, the more uh, thermo thermodynamically stable forms of carbonate precipitate out later and further away. And our preliminary data do show a pattern that kind of looks like that. So that's something that we're gonna be looking at um, as we continue on with this study, looking to see if there are patterns in the cement mineralogy that we can use to help understand the brine formation process here. 
so I have a follow up question on that. Is that a matter of aragonite developing first and then being replaced by calcite or are there are there stratigraphic layers in which you have aragonite and then calcite? I think along a flow path, whether it be lateral or vertical, when the brine first enters the subsurface, um, maybe aragonite is one of the first phases to precipitate out because the brine is so super saturated, right? And then it becomes less so. And so then calcite starts to precipitate out. Okay. That's the, that's the idea we're testing right now. It could be that when we look at this more closely, there's no pattern at all. And then we're gonna be um, <laughs> having a good time trying to understand what's going on. Absolutely. It's, I, I find it quite fascinating how there's a vertical exchange as well as a horizontal exchange. So, you know, it might just be is very well like intermixed. And then when you add in thermodynamics in the exchange there that alters then the carbonate, uh, it's uh, very interesting to see. And I'm, I'm really eager also to, to find out the future of the clumped isotopes that are associated with that, if they can detect potentially that thermo exchange. So it would be really interesting. Um, I also have another question then. So you mentioned that potentially the brines could be then on exoplanets and different things and potential habitats for uh, extremophiles. Are you, or is there also a, a combination of work being done to detect those extremophiles that are currently within those brines that you're studying? Well, I'm not doing that, but uh, during the Andrel project, there were a set of cores that were taken, uh, carefully preserved and frozen for someone who is going to do that work. Um, but I haven't seen any outcomes from that. That's not saying it hasn't been done. I just haven't, haven't seen any results of that work. Okay, well, maybe a future PhD. <laughs> so yeah. good PhD project for that. Yeah, um, well, the brine has been consumed by now okay. in analyses. Um, uh, you might, I mean, someone might want to do a study of some of the cement phases to s at, at the SEM scale to see if you can see any evidence for microbes being involved in these processes. That would definitely be interesting. Those images, I, I would think, hopefully would, if there are extremophiles in there, you could definitely detect microbes. Um, we have another question from Unai from Spain. Hi, Tracy. Thanks for the presentation. Does cement composition or quantity vary with the different paleoclimates or environments of the strat stratigraphic record? That is a great question. And that was one of the first things we looked at because, uh, you know, Chris Fielding set up a sequence, uh, developed the sequence stratigraphy of these cores. And so we were looking at some relationship between sequence stratigraphy and cementation. And overall, we didn't see much of a pattern, but the only thing we saw that affected the distribution of cements was that sometimes during the warmer periods, there was more mud being deposited. So we have these muddy impermeable layers trapping uh, deltaic deposits, sandy deltaic deposits between them. And many of those sandy deltaic deposits have no cement in them. And so the idea is that perhaps the brine couldn't infiltrate those deposits because of the, um, the muddy deposits surrounding them, kept that from happening. But that's really the only pattern that we could see in terms of sequence stratigraphy and climate. Yeah, so the, the shorter close time porosity, scale. Ah, okay. The close porosity then of the mud did not let any fluid inclusion occur for the other kinds of samples that are there. That's what it looks like, yeah. Okay. It was an aquaclude or something like that. It prevented the brine from infiltrating into those layers. <clears throat> they still maintain porosities of up to uh, 40%. But those sandy layers, that context is not very common in these cores. It's, it's common in parts of the mid-Miocene when it was warmer, but that's about it. All right, thank you. Do we have any other questions? 
you know, sometimes typing is, is getting the thoughts down. Um, oh, we have another question from Peter Methley um, from Cambridge. Following up on John's question, do you know what might be forming the dolomite cements? And do you think the brine has anything to do with the coarse crystal size? Yeah, well, the brine, uh, the dolomite looks like it's also forming from the brine. Um, so all of these different mineralogies are forming from the brine. Um, it's still an open question about why we're getting dolomite in some cases, calcite in others, and aragonite in others. Um, does the brine have anything to do with the coarse crystal size? Yeah, potentially, if we think about the brine being very dense and basically settling down through the porosity in the basin with a, with a denser brine down there and those cements or those sediments being bathed in this brine for a longer period of time may have allowed um, cement to grow a little bit slower. I don't know. I mean, these are questions that we're asking ourselves. They're great questions, but I don't necessarily have answers to them right now. Wow. Well, um, hopefully the, the research turns out to have some, some answers. <laughs> we have another question from Maurice Tucker in Bath. Um, remarkable images, really nice story. What about the magnesium content in the calcite cements? Could the high porosity layers uh, be where cement has dissolved out? Okay, that's a, another good question. Um, the magnesium content, most of these are low magnesium calcite cements. So one might think they're pretty insoluble. Um, could the high porosity layers be where cement has been dissolved out? Gosh, potentially yes. I would expect to see some remnants of cement that was there if that was the case. Maybe some rounded margins in, in little remnants of cement. There's nothing there. It, it kind of looks like it has never been cemented. I can, I can, I'm, can, I'm certainly, there, there is a, a publication that I didn't share here today that focuses on that interval that I'd be happy to share with anyone who's interested. It has some great images of those sandstones. Great, thank you. Do we have any other questions? Well, I guess not. And uh, thank you everyone for joining in with us uh, for today's lecture. And thank you, Tracy, for being here today. Um, next week's seminar is at the same regular time at 4 p.m. Uh, UK time when Elizabeth Chamberlain will be presenting on a geoarchaeological perspective of challenges and trajectories of the Mississippi Delta communities. The full abstract is on the SEDS online website. Uh, you will not need to register again for future uh, seminars if you're here today, and we hope to see you there. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>